In this course, we explore a technology called HDF5 and see how to use it from within Python. HDF5 lets you organize, access, and share large amounts of information, along with the context that makes it useful. Although HDF stands for Hierarchical Data Format, as you'll see, HDF5 is much more than a simple file format. It's a powerful way of organizing information, an extensive but easy to use programming API, and a rock solid, high performance software library maintained by a dedicated nonprofit organization. Over the past several years, HDF5 has become a commonly used technology in the Python and NumPy communities for handling large numerical data sets in an organized way. To get started, let's discuss the kind of problems that HDF5 is designed to solve. Real world problems come in lots of different shapes and sizes, but many share one common theme, the need to manage a diverse collection of data objects. Not only can a scientist or developer become overwhelmed by the sheer quantity of information, but it can be hard to figure out how to organize that information in a way that can be easily understood, maintained, and shared. Other common themes apply to any technology used for managing data. For example, it's highly desirable that a solution be high performance. In other words, that it support reading and writing data quickly. Another is the ability to scale to large data sizes, much larger than will fit in memory, and sometimes larger than will fit on a single computer. Likewise, any solution should be flexible enough to handle many different kinds of information and relationships between data elements. In other words, it should support heterogeneous data and diverse organizational structures. HDF5 addresses these areas in different ways. To get started, let's talk about one of the most common challenges in data management, handling many pieces of information of different types. Let's suppose we wanted to record the results of an experiment. In this example, we're developing a new kind of machine, performing field tests for a new kind of aircraft engine. The results of a test don't arrive together in a neat bundle. Instead, we have a set of data from the engine and aircraft electronics, another containing sound and voice communication over the radio, another with GPS information as a function of time, yet another with video and image information from the ground, along with weather records, radar data, and so on. How should this information be represented? And more importantly, how can we organize it in a way that lets us draw conclusions about the test? Let's see what happens when we try to record this information using common methods based on a file system. First, we'll have a written log, maybe a text file, containing notes about the test. Then, we'll have an image series, which tracks the aircraft as it goes through the trials. We'll also have sound and voice recordings, then raw data on aircraft performance, some additional sensor readings from various equipment on board. We also have a video series recorded by an onboard camera. In later tests, more camera angles, and more, and more. And finally, we have the results of our test as a big pile of disconnected pieces of data, all stored separately in their own formats and with their own metadata. This is how it might look on the computer. The data consists of a number of files. How do we keep these files organized? You might notice one common approach seen here. We put the information in the file name. That's because, apart from format-specific information, like image size and color depth, the only place we can add context information is by editing the file names. We might introduce a naming convention, reserving sections of the file name for things like the date, a trial number, or an image count, for example, 001, 002, and so on. Or we might decide to create a directory structure that captures some of this information. But that creates another problem. Since each file can only go in one folder, we have to decide ahead of time how to organize the data. So, for example, we might have a folder containing all the data records for a particular flight. This works well, if you want to retrieve all data on a per-flight basis. But what happens if we want to read just one piece of data, for example, engine performance, across all flights? Or if we're testing more than one prototype? With this kind of system, just figuring out how to extract the data we want can become a time-consuming and error-prone step in the analysis workflow. It's also fragile and inflexible. It becomes tricky to move things around, for example, once you start writing scripts 
that assume particular files are in particular locations. These problems can certainly be solved, but it's a lot of work. And of course, we have to manually synchronize all this information with the notes in the experiment log. The image files, for example, only carry information about their shape and color space, when it would be useful to also know what part of the aircraft they track. HDF5 is designed to address these issues. As we'll see in later lectures, HDF5 provides the means to not only store this information efficiently, but also to keep track of context information, or metadata, required to make sense of it. HDF5's metadata system allows you to store information right next to the data it describes. So there's no extra step required to give your data context. All the information is in one place. HDF5's grouping mechanism is much more expressive than folders and file names, and doesn't restrict you to an inflexible, one-size-fits-all tree of folders. Objects can be found in more than one group, which allows you to create multiple views on the same data and access it in multiple ways, whichever is best for your application. And you can also create new views on your data long after data has been collected without interfering with the structures already in place. Using HDF5, all this information can be stored, organized, retrieved, and later updated all in a single bundle. Here, the HDF5 file contains complete representation of the experiment. This experiment can be analyzed, shared, or archived, all in one comprehensive and self-contained piece. Let's talk about another important area that HDF5 addresses, the need to handle larger data sets with good performance. For small problems, people often start off using text formats like CSV. They work quite well when data is on the order of kilobytes or megabytes. But at a certain point, the demands on disk space and memory become so large that the analysis process slows down. We find ourselves waiting longer and longer for what should be simple operations to complete. For example, just opening a data file. From the perspective of a user or developer, this is frustrating because many tasks deal only with a fraction of the data. For example, we might want to analyze only a few rows from a spreadsheet. We have a large file on disk and a smaller amount of computer memory available for analysis. This would be great if there was some way to read just the rows we want. They might fit into memory and we could proceed. But more typically, workflows are designed around the assumption that we can safely load all data into memory at once. And at a certain point, this stops working. HDF5 addresses this problem by supporting partial I.O. In other words, the ability to specify just a portion of the data to read or write between disk and memory. From a Python developer's perspective, this means you can entirely skip the process of writing a data importer. As we'll see later, HDF5 datasets can be treated much like ordinary NumPy arrays that happen to be stored on disk. That means no writing parsing or reading code. Just open the file and retrieve the parts that you want. HDF5 is an excellent platform for sharing data. It's implemented by a high-performance, widely used open source library. That means that your HDF5 files will work in Python, MATLAB, IDL, or any other platform that uses this library. It's very common in the scientific and engineering communities to use HDF5 for data interchange and also for archival use. Finally, it's important to note that HDF5 is supported by an independent, nonprofit organization called the HDF Group. The HDF Group not only maintains and improves the library, but provides many useful tools and serves as the hub of the HDF community. As you consider if HDF5 is right for you, Keep in mind this data management landscape and where HDF5 excels. In this course, you learn how to use the tools that HDF5 provides within Python to develop solutions to a variety of common data management problems. We begin with an introduction to HDF5's extremely simple, yet powerful and flexible data model, organized around three basic building blocks, datasets, attributes, and groups. Next, you'll learn about some of HDF5's most powerful features including partial I.O. for fast data access, the self-documenting features of HDF5 files that help with maintenance and sharing, and compound data types that provide great flexibility and ways to store your data. Finally, we'll dive into some of the more advanced aspects of HDF5 
that support efficient and scalable computing, including storage layouts and compression. And we finished with an overview of some handy command line tools that make working with HDF5 files even easier. Along with the video lectures, be sure to take time to complete the exercises. After all, the best way to learn programming concepts is by sitting down and actually doing some programming.